I glanced around, disoriented. The dense forest stretched in every direction, with no familiar landmarks to guide me. Birds flitted between branches, and small animals rustled through the underbrush, each absorbed in its search for food. The air was crisp, carrying a raw, untainted scent unlike anything I had ever experienced. Not even the secluded depths of the forbidden forest at Hogwarts smelled this pure. It was as though civilization hadn't touched this place for centuries. Of course, I couldn't have landed anywhere near a village, I muttered to myself, rubbing my temple in frustration. I quickly assessed my belongings. My shirt had been torn during the confrontation with Mundus, but with a flick of my wand, I conjured a new black shirt to cover my bare skin. My pockets contained a few essentials, a burn paste, some Mertlap essence, and a featherweight pouch filled with galleons for emergencies. At least I was somewhat prepared. As I scanned the forest for any sign of a path or a structure, Erebus, my sentient weapon, stirred with unease. There's something peculiar here, he murmured. The energy in this place. I've spent countless lifetimes mastering the currents of magic, but this feels different. It's familiar yet foreign at the same time. Are you saying we've lost control of our powers? I asked, pushing through the dense foliage. In the distance, a few deer stood grazing, but they quickly darted away as I approached. No, Erebus responded. Our abilities are intrinsic to us. They aren't reliant on the magic of the environment. What I mean is, we might encounter forces that behave differently than anything either of us has ever encountered before. I considered his words carefully. So you're saying that whatever we face here is bound by different rules, magic that operates on principles we've never seen? Precisely he replied, his voice tinged with an unfamiliar hint of uncertainty. It's reminiscent of something I encountered long ago, yet it defies explanation. Give me time to examine the forces at play. Take all the time you need, I said with a sigh, adjusting my grip on my wand. I addressed Balthazar, my ever-complaining viper companion, who had taken up residence against my arm for warmth. Stay put for now, Balthazar. It's too cold to waste energy on warming charms. Don't worry, he replied lazily. Your body heat and the shirt are plenty for now. I could almost sense his smirk as he settled comfortably. As I trudged through the woods, I was struck by the untouched fudged beauty of the landscape. Ancient trees loomed overhead, their branches intertwining to form a natural canopy that filtered the sunlight into delicate patterns on the forest floor. It was a stark contrast to the suburban streets of my childhood, and even to Hogwarts, where the wildness was always tempered by human presence. Here, nature ruled without contest, shaping the land as it pleased. A faint sound caught my attention, rushing water. I stopped to listen, the forest's other noises fading as I focused on the rhythmic flow. With a grin, I headed in the direction of the sound, and soon enough, I stumbled upon a wide, flowing river. This was a good sign. Where there was a river, there might be settlements nearby, places where I could trade my gold, find a meal, and rest. Even if I could fly, crossing entire oceans without a plan seemed foolish. Why don't you fly up and get a lay of the land? Balthazar suggested. If you find a town, you'll know which direction to head. Good thinking, Balthazar. I hissed in agreement. I'll owe you a meal for that. Make it a mouse, and we'll call it even. His tone was playful, but fatigue was creeping in, reminding me of the strain from my recent battle with Mundus. Though I had healed my injuries by absorbing his power, I had expended almost all of it to strike him down. Still, I summoned what strength remained. My body tingled as I drew upon the magic within, and arcs of bluish-white lightning crackled to life, spreading from my back to form shimmering wings. The air seemed to hum with energy as I ascended above the treetops, the world unfolding below me in all its wild splendor. This place might have been untouched for ages, but I wasn't here for sightseeing. I needed to find out where I had landed, and more importantly, how I was going to get back home. I grinned as the thrill of flight surged through me. The best skill I'd ever learned. My wings beat the air furiously, lifting me higher and higher past the treetops and far above the landscape. I didn't dare look down until I was sure I'd gained enough altitude. When I finally did, my breath caught in my throat. Below me stretched an untouched wilderness, pristine and unspoiled by human hands. It was like stepping into a world that had never known the pollution and destruction of modern industry. 
a sight utterly foreign to anyone who had grown up in the chaos of the 20th and 21st centuries. Where am I? I muttered, more to myself than anything else. Looking down, I saw the river I'd stumbled upon earlier, now a thin ribbon far below. I followed its winding path and saw that it flowed from a large lake to the northeast, if my sense of direction was still reliable, which it usually was. On the northern shore of that lake stood a towering castle, stark against the untouched wilds surrounding it. Could we... could we have traveled back in time? I wondered aloud, eyeing the ancient structure. It certainly looked medieval. Without waiting for an answer, I angled my wings and descended toward the treetops, keeping low to avoid detection as I neared the castle. Time travel would be preferable, Erebus said darkly as I touched down in a dense patch of forest, as close to the castle as I could manage without being seen. But no, this is something far worse. Worse? I repeated, already uneasy. We are not on Earth, Erebus continued, his tone sharp and unyielding. This place, it's not your world or mine. Not Earth, I echoed, the weight of his words sinking in. You're saying we're on another planet? But I thought there was no other life out there. Given what we had just endured, the violent clash with Mundus, Dante, and Virgil in the space between realms, it wasn't impossible. Mundus had unleashed catastrophic energy storms, meteors, and beams of raw power that could have sent us anywhere. Yet the idea of waking up on a completely alien world was a shock I hadn't fully prepared for. No, Erebus corrected, his voice tinged with frustration and, surprisingly, a hint of desperation. Worse than another planet, I can't sense the realm of darkness, nor my children. The very forces of this universe feel alien. We are not home. Not home? I repeated, the words, feel, the words feeling foreign and wrong on my tongue. My stomach clenched with dread as I struggled to process the implication. How can we not be home? Where else could we be? Erebus's tone was deadly serious now. A different world, that's a different universe, parallel to ours, but not the same. Close enough that we weren't destroyed crossing into it, but different enough for me to sense it. We're in an entirely separate reality. No, I muttered, shaking my head in denial. That's impossible. There's no way. Then explain those beings that tried to trick us earlier. The darkness and the red priest. Erebus pressed on, his voice cutting through my doubts. And those children you sensed all around us? I paused, uncertainty gnawing at me. He was right. I had felt something strange earlier, something off, something wrong. I let out a frustrated breath and tried to push the growing dread out of my mind, but it clung to me like a shadow. I don't understand, I whispered, though I knew deep down that I was just trying to stall the inevitable conclusion. You do understand, Erebus growled. You just refuse to accept it, but the truth is staring you in the face. I, I started, then stopped. Closing my eyes, I reached out with my magic, letting a thin tendril of lightning connect me to the world around me. For a brief moment, I felt everything, distant and foreign energies that didn't belong. The darkness far to the north, the strange presence of children nearby, the red priest to the east and a man with many faces scattered around concentrated heavily in the south, and all of them seemed aware of me, watching. I severed the connection quickly, heart pounding in my chest. You see now, don't you? Erebus asked softly. We are not home. He was right. Even with my limited experience sensing the energy of the world, I could feel how wrong this place was. The magic, the very essence of it, was skewed, unfamiliar. This wasn't Earth. It wasn't anywhere I'd ever known. I, I stammered, overwhelmed by the reality sinking in. What about everyone else? What about Sirius, Daphne, Ron, Hermione, the Weasleys? What about Dumbledore and Voldemort? I don't know. Erebus admitted, I've never heard of dimension travelers, only the existence of other dimensions. So, what? I snapped, feeling the panic rise in my chest. We're stuck here? Is that what you're saying? Yes, Erebus replied bluntly, his voice devoid of any comfort, and you'd better get a grip on yourself and figure out what comes next. I was stranded in an entirely new world, far from anyone and anything I'd ever known. Panic clawed at the edges of my mind, but I couldn't afford to break down now. Erebus was right. If I didn't get a hold of myself and adapt to this new reality, survival wasn't going to be possible. I was about to snap back at Balthazar, but a sigh escaped me. He was right, after all. It's all right, the voice in my arm soothed. I'm here. 
I nodded, swallowing the lump in my throat as I wiped the lingering tears from my eyes with my sleeve. I was grateful, at least, to have some form of companionship in this strange journey. Taking a deep breath, I looked down at my clothes, comparing them to what I had seen when was in worn by the red-robed priest and the children glimpsed in that liminal space. The children had simple tunics, while the priest's robe had been grand, billowing around him like a crimson fog. My own attire felt out of place here, so I decided to make a change. With a quick flick, I vanished the shirt. I vanished the shirt I was wearing, conjuring in its place a dark green tunic made of cotton. It was familiar, comfortable. While I knew older tunics were often wool or linen, I preferred the softness of cotton, a material I knew well. I slipped it on, adjusting to the feel of this medieval-like world. Exiting the forest, I caught sight of the towering stone walls of the castle in the distance. The walls rose about 30 feet, with square towers at each corner and a sprawling city encircled its base. It was an impressive sight as I moved closer, searching for an entrance. The cobblestone streets led me to a grand gate, its archway framing the city beyond. As I neared the gate, two guards posted on either side watched me carefully. When I was within 10 feet, they stepped forward, weapons drawn. Halt, the guard on the left barked. Who goes there? And so began a new chapter in my life. It took some careful negotiation, but eventually I convinced the city guards to let me through. I told them I was a traveler from the east, knocked unconscious during an attack by bandits. They seemed suspicious at first, but my story held. Fortunately, they spoke English, though not quite like I did, which worked to my advantage. Their speech was tinged with a northern English accent, and their phrasing was archaic, reminiscent of something straight out of the Middle Ages. It reminded me of the ancient texts I had seen back in Hogwarts Library, old manuscripts with unfamiliar spellings and strange turns of phrase. Their language was tough to decipher at times, but not impossible. My awkward pauses and careful wording as I adjusted to their dialect added credibility to my fabricated tale, just as a foreigner might struggle to express themselves. A few words I used threw them off, modern terms that had no equivalent in their time, but I quickly adapted, matching their speech patterns as best as I could. An hour later, sitting in a tavern, I dug into a plate of steak and potatoes with unrestrained hunger. The owner, an older man with thinning gray hair and a thick, grizzled beard, had given me a strange look when I made my request. He seemed doubtful that a traveler like me could afford such a meal, but his eyes widened when I dropped a small stack of nuts onto the counter. The currency wasn't quite what they were used to, but the weight of metal seemed to be enough. As I ate, I reflected on how quickly I had adjusted to this place. It was strange, but I had no choice. The world I found myself in was far from the one I knew. If I were to survive, I'd need to blend in, not just with my words and attire, but with my very presence. Each new encounter here felt like a test, a challenge I had to navigate carefully. The road ahead was uncertain, but I could feel that something larger was at play, waiting for me just beyond the walls of this city. After some haggling and my assurances that the coins I had were genuine copper, the innkeeper accepted two of them and handed back the rest, before heading to the kitchen to prepare the food. It was a relief to find someone with a sense of fairness. In unfamiliar lands, honesty can be a rare quality. As I took a bite of the meal, a potato that was still a bit undercooked, I found myself lost in thought, barely registering the taste. My mind was preoccupied with how I had ended up here. The guards at the gate had called this place Torhen Square. I pretended to recognize the name, feigning relief and gratitude until they let me through, likely out of pity for my bewilderment. But as for how I truly arrived here, it was during the clash with Mundus, the demon emperor, in the space between realms. Even though he had lost the battle, he managed to trap me there, thinking it would ensure his eventual victory. The memory made my hand tremble slightly. I could have been left to starve or worse, to exist endlessly in that void, cut off from everything and everyone I knew. It was impossible to know what would have happened if I hadn't acted when I did. To escape, I tore open a rift with Erebus, forcing our way into a realm that seemed to overlap with the one I came from. But could I replicate the process here? Before I could entertain that thought further, Erebus spoke up, his voice resonating within my mind. No, he said, the tone edged with amusement, 
The dark rift won't open a path back to our world. So it's truly impossible, I thought. I wouldn't say that, Erebus replied, but for now, we need to take stock of our situation and search for those who wield power in this world. They may hold the answers we need. Before I could ponder his advice, the sound of approaching footsteps interrupted my thoughts. Turning, I saw a group of men eyeing me and the pocket from which I had drawn the coins earlier. Clearly, they had heard the jingle of money. A bunch of thieves? Here? I couldn't help but smirk. Even if they dared to make a move, my pocket was protected by enchantments that would only yield to me. It would take more than a common pickpocket, or even a capable wizard if they existed here, to bypass that. Can I help you? I asked, keeping my voice light as I continued chewing on the potato, giving the impression that I wasn't the least bit concerned. One of the men scratched his head and glanced at his companions, then at the innkeeper, who shot him a stern glare. The man quickly backed off, muttering something under his breath. The boldest fool I've seen in a while, I said, half smiling despite the heaviness of my situation. Trying to rob someone in broad daylight. The innkeeper chuckled. I wouldn't judge him too harshly. Um, he hesitated, clearly unsure of my name. Harry Potter, I supplied, seeing no reason to use an alias here. Never heard of a house potter, the innkeeper remarked, scratching his chin thoughtfully. You from the Westerlands, then? Not having the faintest idea what he was talking about, I shook my head. No, I come from a distant land in the east. I'm here to learn about the cultures of this continent. The innkeeper seemed satisfied with the answer. Well then, I'll prepare a dish that's a personal favorite of mine for later. I assume you'll be needing a room for the night? I will, I confirmed. There wasn't exactly a wealth of other options for me. Twenty-five coppers a night, he said. Though your currency is different from what we use here, I winced slightly. Is there somewhere I can exchange my coins for your, your local currency? Ah, yes, he replied, stroking his beard as he thought. In the market square near the center of town. Take a right when you leave the inn and walk straight ahead. There's a traveling tradesman who sets up a cart there, calls himself the collector. I resisted the urge to grimace. A man with a title like that was almost certainly a swindler who would take full advantage of my ignorance. Just get a few of their coins, Erebus interrupted my thoughts, so I can understand the design. I'll manage the conversion for you. The suggestion brought some relief, and I nodded to the innkeeper, dismissing him before finishing the last bites of my meal. I glanced at the cup of alcohol I had been given, mead if I wasn't mistaken, it had a hint of honey, but didn't offer the refreshment I was hoping for. Even as I drank it, the familiar warmth of alcohol failed to take hold. I asked for a second cup, more out of habit than desire. It seemed that even alcohol had little effect on me anymore. Another peculiarity to add to the growing list of mysteries about my current state. Was there anything here that could truly affect me? Or was I simply an outsider, immune to the rules that bound this world? After finishing my second cup, I thanked the innkeeper and assured him I'd return later. My destination, a local tradesman, lay across town. The journey took some time, as the settlement was much larger than I'd anticipated. As I made my way through the bustling streets, I nodded at the men, women, and children who passed by, doing my best to maintain a friendly demeanor. Despite my efforts, I couldn't ignore the odd looks they gave me. It didn't take long to figure out why. Could be because you're cleaner than they are, Erebus commented dryly. He wasn't wrong. While these townsfolk looked as though they hadn't bathed in days, maybe even weeks, I had the advantage of magic keeping me spotless. My scouring charm ensured that I stood out, and it was clear they saw me as someone of importance, something I hadn't intended. I sighed inwardly, realizing it was too late to cast a charm to dirty my clothes. Any sudden change would only invite more suspicion, and the last thing I needed was unwanted attention. The town square soon came into view, and I marveled at how imposing the nearby castle looked as I approached the center of the marketplace. The quiet of the alleyways faded, replaced by the lively shouts of merchants hawking their wares and customers haggling for better deals. I took in the sights and sounds, letting them wash over me as I strolled past various shops. Tomreth's Tuns, a wine merchant, caught my eye. Nearby was Master Roth's Bronze Works, a jeweler's establishment. 
I also noticed a large building with a seven-pointed star carved above the entrance, though I had no clue what it represented. As I wandered through the market, I eavesdropped on conversations, trying to gather information. I heard mentions of currencies, gold dragons, silver stags, copper pennies, or was it silver moons and copper stars? The details were confusing. I decided to ask the collector I was seeking for clarification. After a few minutes of walking in circles, I finally approached a merchant's stall and asked where I might find the collector. The man, a rotund fellow with flushed cheeks, eyed me suspiciously before gesturing toward a modest cart in the distance. Behind it sat a man who looked entirely uninterested in the throngs of potential customers passing by. I made my way over, studying him as I drew near. He appeared older from afar, but up close, I realized he couldn't have been much more than 25. What I'd mistaken for graying hair was just a strip of cloth caught in his messy black locks. His face was clean-shaven, though several small cuts marred his neck, suggesting he hadn't quite mastered the art of shaving without injury. As I approached, he noticed me and straightened slightly. Can I help you? He asked with a smile that didn't reach his eyes. Suppressing the urge to roll my eyes, I replied, The innkeeper mentioned you're a collector of rare items. His interest peaked. That's correct, he said, leaning forward. Do you have something of value? I smiled faintly and reached into my featherweight pouch, pulling out a handful of golden galleons and placing them on the table. His eyes widened in surprise. He picked up one of the coins, biting down it lightly before nodding to himself. Where did you find these? He asked, his tone curious but measured. In an old temple, far to the east, I lied smoothly. What do you make of them? The collector examined the dragon emblem engraved on the coin. They could be relics from the empire of Old Valyria, he speculated. I had no idea what Old Valyria was, but it sounded impressive enough. Could be, I shrugged. I'm more interested in selling them than learning their history. Are you buying? The man's excitement was barely contained, though he tried to mask it. I remained calm, pretending to be disinterested as he considered his offer. I might be, he said, reaching into a drawer and pulling out several pouches filled with coins. I'd offer you 300 gold dragons. It's a generous price, given the value of the gold. I took one of the pouches and examined the coins inside. He wasn't wrong. The amount of gold he was offering far exceeded the worth of the few galleons I'd shown him. Hmm, I mused. I'll take the deal, but I also need something from you. And what would that be, he asked, suddenly cautious. I'm having trouble understanding the local currency, I admitted. I've heard talk of silver stags, copper pennies, moon stars. Can you explain? He smiled, seeming relieved by the question. Ah, that's a common confusion for newcomers, he said. The main currency is the gold dragon, and from there, it breaks down into smaller denominations, silver stags and copper pennies. That stars and moons are older coins still in circulation but becoming rare. He continued, outlining the system for me. One gold dragon equals 210 silver stags. One silver stag equals 56 copper pennies. A star is worth eight pennies and a moon seven pennies. And a moon is worth seven stags. I nodded thoughtfully, asking for a silver stag, a copper penny, and a map of the region to accompany the payment. The merchant obliged, handing over the coins and map along with the rest of the gold. After thanking him, I slipped into a nearby alley and transferred all the coins into my featherweight pouch, already brimming with galleons, sickles, and nuts. You think you can handle this? I asked Erebus, holding the map loosely in my hand. Child's play, the sword responded, its will intertwining with the contents of the pouch. Moments later, the magic ceased. It's done. I reached into my pouch and pulled out a handful of coins. Instead of sickles, I held silver stags. Instead of galleons, I had gold dragons. Satisfied, I pocketed the money and turned to leave. Well, well. A group of ragged men approached, their grins filled with malice. What do we have here? A lost little lord wandering the streets? I'm not a noble, I replied, my tone flat, uninterested. You sure look like one, the man on the right sneered, eyeing me up and down. Prettier than most girls, even. A shudder of revulsion crawled up my spine at his leering gaze. Maybe girls desperate enough to talk to you. You look like a dog left a mess on your face. My retort hit its mark, and for a brief moment, his companions stifled their laughter. Shut up, 
he barked, his temper flaring as he slapped one of his men so hard the poor guy stumbled to his knees, dazed. Anyone else feel like laughing? The others fell silent, cowed by his outburst. I studied them briefly. Their gaunt faces and filthy clothes told me they hadn't eaten in days. Despite their rough behavior, I felt a flicker of pity for them. Look, I said, gaining their attention. You can walk away now. I won't hold it against you. The leader sneered again, his voice dripping with venom. Afraid, we won't be doing that, little lordling. Now, hand over your... He didn't get to finish. I closed the distance in an instant, my fists slamming into his gut, sending a small jolt of lightning through his body. His eyes bulged as he gasped for air, his breath stolen by the shock. He tried to stand, but his muscles refused to cooperate, leaving him twitching helplessly on the ground. As I was saying, I continued, my gaze cold as I looked down at him. I turned to his companions, my voice steady. You're free to leave. They stared at me, dumbfounded. I said, go. I snapped, and like startled animals, they scrambled away, vanishing into the shadows. I chuckled at the absurdity of it, grown men fleeing from a boy barely 16. Then I noticed movement. The leader, still incapacitated, was attempting to crawl away, dragging himself pathetically across the cobblestone. I stepped on his leg, pressing down hard. He yelped in pain, his voice filled with desperation. Please, my lord, I swear I won't do it again. Is that so? I asked calmly, increasing the pressure until I felt the bones strain beneath my boot. Yes, yes, please, he begged, his voice rising in panic. Perhaps I should hand you over to the authorities, I mused. Let them decide your fate. No, he cried out, panic lacing his voice. They'll take my hand, or worse, send me to the wall. The wall? I asked, curious now. Explain. The man hurriedly described a massive wall of ice far to the north, over 700 feet tall, if his words were to be believed. He spoke of a place where criminals, outcasts, and the unfortunate were sent to guard the realm from savage tribes known as the Wildlings. Life as a man of the night's watch, he explained, was a miserable one, devoid of glory, inheritance, or family. Desertion meant death. Please, my lord, he continued to beg. Show mercy. I rolled my eyes and released his leg. Go on, then. Thank you, my lord. He attempted to kiss my feet, but I kicked him aside in disgust. Just go, I growled. You disgust me. As he scurried off, I made my way back to the inn. Inside, a bard had begun playing a soft tune on an instrument that looked like a distant ancestor of the guitar. The innkeeper, a man in his fifties with a graying beard, nodded as I approached and placed seven silver stags on the counter. This should cover my stay for a few weeks, I assume, I said. The innkeeper nodded, pocketing the coins. Indeed, I'll have my son show you to your room. Edmund, he called out, and after a moment, a voice replied, Coming. The sound of footsteps followed, and soon a boy about my age appeared, moving past the bard. He glanced at me briefly before turning to his father. Yes, father. Take this man to the top room, the innkeeper instructed, waving him off. Edmund nodded and turned to me. Follow me. I followed the boy up several flights of stairs, the bard's music growing fainter with each step. Eventually, we reached a door at the top. Edmund pulled a key from his pocket and unlocked it, pushing the door open. The room was modest, a simple bed, a table, a chair, and a small window overlooking the street. A chamber pot sat in the corner, which, despite its necessity, filled me with mild disgust, but I could deal with that later. The room was private, which was all I truly needed. Dinner will be served in an hour if you'd like to join us, my lord, Edmund said after a moment of silence. I'm not a lord, I corrected. And it's Harry, not my lord. He blinked relief flooding his face as his posture relaxed. Ah, yes. Sorry. You seem tense, I noted. Are the lords here not kind to you? Edmund hesitated before replying. It's not that they're cruel. It's just they're lords, you know? They act like they're better than you because of their birth? I guessed, and Edmund nodded, grateful for my understanding. Yeah, he agreed. Exactly. Well, like I said, I'm no lord, just Harry. I extended my hand, after a moment of hesitation, Edmund grinned and gave it a firm shake. I'd be glad to join you all for dinner, I said, setting the map on the table and unfurling it before taking a seat. I glanced at the boy who had been waiting expectantly, just as soon as I finished my work. The boy blinked as if snapped out of a daydream. Oh, he exclaimed, looking sheepish. I forgot to tie up one of the customer's horses. With that, he dashed out of the room. I chuckled and shook my head, locking the door behind him. 
Turning my attention back to the map, I studied it closely. If there had been any doubt about the strange nature of this place, the map dispelled it. The names and layout didn't match any place I recognized. Yet, the map was written in English, a strange comfort that suggested this world wasn't entirely alien. Torhin Square, I muttered, scanning the parchment for the name. Where is it? My search took me across the western side of the continent. Finally, I found it near the center west in a region labeled the Westerlands. It didn't look like much, a small mark compared to nearby places like Lannisport and Casterly Rock. Tracing my finger northward, I recalled the ramblings of the would-be thief earlier. He had spoken of a massive wall to the north that held back all manner of dangers. Sure enough, there it was, a thick white line stretching across the northernmost part of the map, labeled simply as The Wall. Below it lay scattered names like Winterfell, White Harbor, and finally, Torrens Square. So this was The North. What kind of name is The North, anyway? I scoffed, rolling my eyes. What's above the wall, then? The even more north? The real north? At least now we know our location, hissed Balthazar, breaking his long silence. Fair enough, I replied in the same serpentine tongue before switching back to English. Now the question is, what's the plan? The objective remains unchanged, Erebus, my sentient sword, spoke in my mind. We need to find a way back to our own realm, I nodded. That much was clear. To do that, Erebus continued, we must gather information. I suggest starting with the marketplace, a bookshop if one exists. We need to learn more about this wall and the lands it separates. That makes sense, I agreed. The thief said the wall was built to keep out tribes from beyond, but you don't build a 700-foot wall just to fend off some ragtag clans with spears. Precisely, Erebus replied. It's not the people we need to worry about. It's the darkness that lurks beyond. There are signs of something far more menacing. A chill ran through me at his words. You mean something unnatural? A threat woven into the cold itself? Yes, Erebus confirmed. The cold darkness with eyes like blue fire. A sinking feeling crept over me as I stared at the map. It wasn't just a barrier. It was a bastion against something unspeakable. If that's true, I breathed, then whatever it is might be bound to that frozen expanse. The wall stands as the only thing separating us from it. Just don't call it the North North, Balthazar interjected, sounding exasperated. Why not? It's straightforward. North of the North, it fits. I argued, stifling a grin as I felt the scales on my right arm twitch with agitation. It's ridiculous, Balthazar retorted. I didn't learn multiple languages to indulge in such nonsense. It's beneath us. Well, it's decided. I hissed back with finality, half expecting Erebus to chime in with a sarcastic remark. Yes. Uh, naturally, Erebus intoned dryly. The North North could indeed be the origin of this dark power. Ignoring Balthazar's ongoing protests, I continued to study the map, shifting my focus to the southern regions. A vast desert expanse labeled Dorne stood out at the continent's lower edge. Do you suppose the mysterious red priests hail from there? It's plausible, Erebus replied. Though we can't be certain, it could just as easily be somewhere in the eastern lands. Deserts are hardly scarce on this map. I cursed under my breath, frustrated by how little I understood. You're right, I admitted. We're grasping at straws. We need more information. That's exactly why I insist we find a place where we can learn about this world's history, its power structures, and key figures, Erebus pressed. We're at a disadvantage until we know more. I gave a resigned nod, rolling up the map and tapping it with my wand to shrink it for easier carrying. There was much to unravel, and not just about the wall or the distant deserts. A third faction lingered at the back of my mind, children I had glimpsed during my last encounter. They seemed harmless enough, but the most innocent-seeming things often concealed the greatest dangers. I had learned that the hard way, how often had the least threatening turned out to be the most treacherous. Take Wormtail, for instance, an unassuming rat who fooled everyone, costing my godfather over a decade in Azkaban and my parents their lives. Shaking off those thoughts, I stowed the map in my pocket and made for the door. There was work to be done, and not the kind that could be accomplished with a wand alone. It would involve hours of research, something I'd grown to dread, but it was unavoidable. For now, though, I needed food and rest. 
the journey to the so-called North-North would be grueling, and I would need every ounce of strength to face what lay ahead. Fur, we are not calling it the North-North, Balthazar insisted one last time, his indignation almost comical. I chuckled to myself, leaving the room with a small, defiant smile. A week had passed since my arrival in this unfamiliar world, and despite my initial hesitation, I had followed Erebus's advice and buried myself in research. I needed to survive, after all, and that meant understanding the intricacies of this land. My afternoons were spent poring over dusty tomes while Balthazar lounged lazily nearby. Each page turned was a distraction from the thoughts that kept pulling me back to the people I'd left behind. Every so often, my gaze would drift toward the doorway, half expecting to see familiar faces, Sirius, Remus, or Daphne, standing there. But no one came. They were gone, and if I failed, I would never see them again. That thought alone drove me forward. I threw myself into the history of this strange continent, which was more engaging than the history lessons at Hogwarts ever were. Perhaps it was because there wasn't a droning ghost to put me to sleep, or perhaps the stakes were higher here. Either way, I read on, trying to understand the land that had become my new reality. The earliest inhabitants of Westeros, I learned, were the Children of the Forest, a mysterious race with supernatural abilities, though the specifics remained unclear. Alongside them were giants, another ancient race. These beings lived in harmony with the land, hunting and farming, and they worshipped nameless gods of nature. They carved faces into bone-white weirwood trees with red leaves, a practice I found particularly curious. The carved faces felt familiar, perhaps a connection to the entities I'd encountered in the void during my confrontation with the deities. I had no doubt they were related. Then came the first men, invaders from the eastern continent of Essos. They crossed into Westeros through a land bridge known as the Arm of Dorne, which the children of the forest later destroyed with magic in a desperate attempt to halt the invasion. A centuries-long war ensued between the two peoples until they eventually reached a pact at the Isle of Faces. This event ushered in the Age of Heroes, a period of fragile peace. The Wall, one of the nine man-made wonders of the world, was built sometime after this pact. Its sheer scale was staggering, 300 miles long, 700 feet high, and wide enough for knights to ride side by side along its top. Constructed of solid ice and stone, it was designed to keep out the mysterious and deadly race known as the Others, or White Walkers, creatures of ice with blue, star-like eyes and the ability to raise the dead. Their descriptions were eerie, but I couldn't dismiss them. I'd seen something similar in the void, confirming their existence despite the historical records claiming they hadn't been seen in over 8,000 years. The wall was more than just a barrier. It was a symbol of an ancient struggle. It had been erected by Brandon the Builder with the help of the children of the forest and the giants to protect the realm from the others after the long night, a winter that lasted an entire generation bringing famine and death. The combined forces of the children, first men, and even giants had pushed the others back, but the legend of their return lingered like a ghost over the land. The men who defended the wall, the Night's Watch lived a bleak existence, abandoning their homes, families, and even their identities to protect the realm. These soldiers were bound to a life of celibacy and sacrifice, watching over the northern borders for threats that most believed had long since vanished. Yet I knew better. The threat was real, lurking beyond the wall's icy expanse. As I continued to read, the history of Westeros began to unfold in waves of conquest and bloodshed. After the long night, Peace reigned for a time until a new threat emerged. The Andals, a warrior people from the east, bringing with them superior steel weapons and a new religion. The Andals swept through the southern kingdoms, destroying the sacred weirwood trees and eradicating the children of the forest. The first men fought back, but they were no match for the Andal steel and military might. Only the north resisted, aided by the treacherous swamps of the Neck and the fortress of Moat Kaelin, where entire armies were swallowed by the bogs. The North, isolated and protected, maintained its loyalty to the old gods, the nameless, faceless deities of nature. Meanwhile, the rest of Westeros embraced the Andal religion, the faith of the Seven. This new faith, with its seven divine aspects, seemed overly structured to me, a stark contrast to the elemental and mysterious old gods. 
the seven were more like avatars of a singular deity, each representing a different facet of life. The father for justice, the mother for mercy and childbirth, the maiden for innocence and beauty, the crone for wisdom, and so on. It was during the Andal conquest that I realized just how fragile human civilization could be. Kingdoms rose and fell, not through innovation or diplomacy, but through war, coercion, and marriage alliances. It was a harsh reminder that power here was fleeting, shaped by brute force and survival instincts. Barbaric though it was, this cycle of conquest and destruction had defined Westeros for centuries. The book closed with the near extinction of the children of the forest and the consolidation of Andal rule across most of the continent. Yet the North remained distinct, a place where the old ways endured, a land bound by its ancient gods and rugged traditions. It struck me how different the North seemed, standing apart in both culture and faith, resistant to the sweeping changes that had consumed the rest of the continent. As I finished the last chapter, I realized that my survival in this world wouldn't just depend on magic or strength, but on understanding these complex histories, these shifting alliances and hidden truths. Westeros was a land where the past was never truly gone and ancient forces still stirred beneath the surface. If I was to navigate this world, I'd have to respect the power of its history and the forces that shaped it. The fifth god was the warrior, symbolizing strength and valor in battle. The sixth, the smith, embodied creation and craftsmanship, while the seventh and final figure, the stranger, represented death. It became clear why the people had gravitated towards this newer religion. The old gods were mysterious, tied to natural forces, forests, rivers, and the earth itself, without distinct rituals or a clear structure. In contrast, the Seven offered an organized system with seps built across the land, marked by the seven-pointed star. There was a symmetry to it that must have appealed to the common folk. Seven gods, seven stars, seven kingdoms. It all fit neatly together. It wasn't hard to see why some farmers stuck in their backward lives found comfort in such simplicity. Yet, despite my disdain for it, history had unfolded regardless of personal opinions. The Andals had come, bringing their faith, and while the North had held them at bay, life in the South changed. And so it went, until 300 years ago, when Aegon the Conqueror arrived with his dragons and systematically brought each kingdom under his control. The wars were brief compared to the long battles of earlier history. Of course, I soon realized that brevity didn't translate into less reading. Quite the opposite, in fact. The history books were filled with endless accounts of kingdoms surrendering, lands being ravaged, and new maps drawn. Aegon and his dragons had rewritten everything. The rule of the Dragon Kings was absolute, until it wasn't. Once the dragons died out, the Targaryen kings began to lose their grip, descending into madness in their futile attempts to recreate the power of their ancestors. One king, obsessed with wildfire, a deadly green substance capable of burning hotter than anything, drank it and died a fiery death. Then there was King Aerys II, the infamous Mad King, who used wildfire to burn his enemies alive. His paranoia spiraled out of control when Lord Stark confronted him over a personal matter involving his son. It was said that Rhaegar Targaryen, Aerys' son, had abducted Lyanna Stark, who was, who was promised to Robert Baratheon, the future king. Lord Rickard Stark, Lyanna's father, went to the capital to demand justice. Instead, he and his son Brandon were arrested on charges of treason. The tragedy that followed was particularly cruel. Rickard demanded trial by combat, a legal right in the Seven Kingdoms that allowed a man to prove his innocence through strength. Eris, twisted in his cruelty, declared fire to be his champion. Rickard was suspended above a fire while his son Brandon, bound by a noose just out of reach of a sword, strangled himself trying to save his father. The sheer brutality of it left a sour taste in my mouth. In the aftermath, Rickard's other son, Eddard Stark, took up arms alongside Robert Baratheon and John Arryn, forming a rebellion that would bring down the Targaryens. Through alliances forged in marriage and battle, they toppled the kingdom and ended Eris's reign. The rebellion was filled with bloody skirmishes, but the decisive moment came when Robert Baratheon killed Rhaegar on the battlefield. The sack of King's Landing followed, where Rhaegar's wife and children were brutally murdered. The only surviving Targaryens, two children, fled to Essos. 
That rebellion was only 14 years ago, a fact I confirmed with more than one local. Time seemed to work similarly to my own world, which at least made adjusting to this place slightly easier. Still, it didn't soften the sting of being torn away from everything familiar and thrown into this chaotic land. I closed the book with a sigh, leaning back in my chair as it creaked under my weight. What am I supposed to do? I muttered to no one in particular. My thoughts wandered to Daphne. The last time I saw her, I had made her cry, and the memory gnawed at me. She probably thought I had died hating her, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Damn it. I furiously wiped away the tears that threatened to spill. I had to stay strong, but could I really return? Was there a way to open a rift between worlds? Uncertain, Erebus whispered from within, careful not to disturb the slumbering viper on the bed. Our passage succeeded because we were already in the in-between. What if I tried opening a dark rift now? I asked, pacing in frustration. Nothing would happen, Erebus replied calmly. I cannot sense the dark realm here. You cannot open a door to a place that does not exist in this world. I grabbed my sword and slashed at the air, hoping for something, anything, but as Erebus had warned, nothing happened. A wave of frustration washed over me. I told you, Erebus said gently, though I could sense his own wariness. Uh, he too had been uprooted, and his timeless existence must have made the shock even more profound. Balthazar, on the other hand, remained indifferent as long as I was around. My presence was enough for him. Yeah, I had to try, I muttered, sheathing Erebus again. What are the chances of finding some kind of magical artifact that could get us back? Extremely low, Erebus admitted. It wasn't what I wanted to hear. To distract myself from the bleakness of that realization, I spent the rest of the day wandering the town, eating and reading more of the history books. Anything to drown out Erebus's ominous words. I even left both Balthazar and the sword in my room, trying to escape their weight. But the question lingered, what if I was stuck here forever? Would there be any point to continuing? I shook off the dark thought immediately. Giving up wasn't an option. I was stronger than that. When I returned to the inn, I let the innkeeper recommend dinner, which turned out to be rabbit stew. It was rich, warm, and surprisingly heavy, a welcome comfort. I devoured it, savoring every bite, and nearly cleaned the plate with my tongue. The innkeeper chuckled at my enthusiasm, clearly pleased with his work. For a moment, as the stew warmed me from the inside, the weight of my predicament lessened. But only for a moment. After leaving a few coppers on the counter, I returned to my room my thoughts now aligned. As I shut the door behind me, Erebus, my loyal black serpent, coiled around my torso and settled on my shoulder with a familiar hiss. Have you decided on our next move? Erebus asked directly, his straightforwardness always a welcome change from the usual small talk. Yes, I replied, taking out an old book titled The Lost Kingdoms of Valyria by some long-dead scholar. Eurystex, I don't think returning home is likely, but we'll keep searching. In the meantime, there are more pressing matters. I set the book aside, continuing, The king is supposedly riding north to Winterfell. I plan to be there when he arrives. It's the best place to start gathering information, and then I'll continue north to the wall. Very well, Erebus acknowledged. When shall we depart? Tonight, I said, deciding on the spot. I'll purchase a horse and follow the main roads. Pat, have you ever ridden a horse before? Balthazar, the spectral voice within, inquired as he nudged his presence closer to my thoughts. No, I admitted, but I've flown on a hippogriff. How different can it be? I spent the remainder of the day bidding farewell to the few acquaintances I had made, Torwind, the elderly bookseller, Edmund, the innkeeper's son, and the collector in the market. Purchasing a horse was a straightforward affair. The stable master was eager to part with the unruly black stallion, saying that the beast had thrown every rider who tried to mount him. But when I approached, I treated him like I would a hippogriff, bowing first, and surprisingly, he dipped his head in return. The stallion was a striking creature, with a deep black coat and a wild mane that seemed to ripple with every step. There was a raw strength in him, but also a calmness when we connected. It felt as though we recognized something kindred in each other, a kind of wild spirit tempered by experience. I led him to the edge of town and let him graze while I ate my own meal. We should give you a name, I mused, feeding him a carrot, something fitting for a creature of your stature. 
Erebus's voice cut in with a suggestion. There was a legendary horse, Jerion, said to gallop with the speed of lightning, his mane burning like blue fire. It would suit a beast of such spirit. Garion, I repeated, letting the name settle on my tongue. Turning to the horse, I asked, what do you think of that? The stallion paused in his chewing and gave a small nod, almost as if he understood the question. Wizards often spoke of animals showing signs of intelligence around them, but this seemed some something more. All right, Jerion, it is, I said, stroking his neck. Garion, the black steed. With Garion named, I mounted him and started down the king's road, maintaining a steady trot. The miles stretched ahead, and though the journey would take several days, I had an idea to speed things up. I stopped Garion by the roadside, channeling a small pulse of magic into him, willing it to enhance his strength rather than harm him. Gerion's reaction was immediate. He reared up with a spirited cry before settling into a gate that covered ground at a remarkable pace. At this speed, we could reach Winterfell in far less time than anticipated. We raced past villages and hamlets, the chill of the night air invigorating both horse and rider. After several hours, I brought him to a halt by a small copse of trees for a break. Gerion showed no signs of fatigue his eyes bright and eager for more. That spell seems to have invigorated him, Erebus observed. Seems that way, I agreed, stepping away to take care of business behind a tree. Why do you always distance yourself for this? Erebus inquired, the question more curious than mocking. Because there are things a man prefers to do in private, I answered, shaking my head. Some lines just aren't meant to be crossed. Humans and their strange rituals, he muttered. As I mounted Garion once more, I cast a glance northward where the wall loomed in my mind's eye, a distant boundary, a frontier separating the known from the unknown. Uh, I didn't know what I would find there, but the mysteries waiting to be unraveled held a magnetic pull. There was something about pushing into the wilderness, confronting what lay beyond civilization that felt like the beginning of a much larger journey. Onward, Garion, I murmured, guiding him back onto the road. Let's see what the North has in store for us. The rest of the journey passed in silence, the steady rhythm of the horse's hooves blending into the quiet of the northern wilderness. I had to lend Garion a bit more power, just enough to keep up the pace, though I knew it was far more efficient than relying on flight. Riding horseback through this landscape, especially with Garion's enhanced speed, made me realize how impractical constant use of magic could be. Besides... There was something grounding about traveling on solid earth, feeling the cold wind whip across my face as we ventured further north. As we rode on, the weather grew harsher, the chill in the air bit deeper, and the winds grew more unforgiving with each passing mile. By dawn, we crested a large hill, the sun casting a soft light over the land below. I decided it was a good place to rest. With a few simple warming charms, the biting wind no longer bothered us, to type, and we could take in the view. From the top of the hill, the distant outline of a massive fortress came into view, its walls towering high above the mist. Even from this distance, the sheer size of it was unmistakable. Winterfell, the ancient seat of House Stark. The walls stretched high, weathered by time, but still standing, formidable and enduring. It was clear this place had seen countless battles, its worn exterior telling the story of centuries of resilience. And yet, Despite its age and imperfections, Winterfell had a quiet strength, as if it was as much a part of the land as the forests and mountains surrounding it. The red leaves of a single tree caught my eye, a weirwood unmistakable even from here. The ancient tree stood tall within the castle's walls, a symbol of the old gods and the deep history that permeated this place. So this is Winterfell, I muttered, allowing myself a brief moment of appreciation before preparing to descend the hill and make my way toward the castle. The journey down was uneventful, and soon enough I reached the gates of Winterfell. The guard stationed at the entrance was stern, but not hostile. State your reason for entry, he demanded, though his tone lacked any real suspicion. Just a traveler, I replied, raising my hand slightly to show I meant no harm. I heard the king was on his way to Winterfell while I was passing through Torrens Square. I wanted to be here when he arrived. The guard gave me a skeptical look, probably assuming I was just another commoner drawn by the prospect of seeing royalty. All right, he muttered, stepping aside and allowing me to pass. 
Winterfell was as vast as it appeared from the outside, its massive granite walls encircling an extensive complex of courtyards, towers, and buildings. The outer wall stood slightly lower than the inner, but both were imposing, easily towering 70 feet or more. A wide moat lay between the walls, likely more of a symbolic barrier than a functional defense in these peaceful times. Despite the absence of active soldiers, I could see the remnants of siege defenses, narrow platforms and parapets where archers could have once rained arrows down on attackers. Now, these fortifications stood empty, serving as little more than a playground for a group of children chasing each other around the grounds. I smiled faintly at the sight of the children, two boys and a girl, accompanied by large animals that I couldn't quite distinguish as either wolves or dogs. It was a simple scene, but one that added life to the cold stone of the castle. Turning away, I headed toward the stables, where the unmistakable sound of hammering steel caught my ear. A quick glance revealed a blacksmith hard at work, the rhythmic clanging of his hammer almost hypnotic. As I approached the stables, I was greeted by a man of considerable size, shoveling hay with ease. He was not as massive as Hagrid, but he was certainly a giant in his own right. His simple expression and wide grin made him seem almost childlike, despite his obvious strength. Hello, I greeted him with a smile. You're the stable hand? The man returned my smile, his voice booming as he replied, Hodor. I blinked in confusion. Hodor, is that your name? Hodor, he repeated, nodding and pointing to himself. Ah, I see, I said, chuckling softly. Well, it's nice to meet you, Hodor. He grinned, clearly pleased with the exchange, and gestured toward the stalls. Hodor, he said, as if inviting me to leave my horse there. I patted Garion on the neck and led him to an empty stall. Don't cause any trouble, all right, I warned the horse, though I knew Garion could be difficult at times. He snorted in response, clearly unimpressed with my instructions. Before leaving the stables, I turned back to Hodor. Do I owe you anything for the stall? Hodor shook his head, still smiling broadly. Thanks, Hodor. I appreciate it. With that, I made my way deeper into Winterfell, observing the bustling preparations for the king's arrival. Servants rushed about, hauling barrels of wine and crates of food toward what I assumed was the Great Hall. The air was filled with the clatter of wood and the murmur of voices, all contributing to the sense of anticipation that hung over the castle. Curiosity led me to a large courtyard where two boys, not much younger than myself, were sparring with wooden sticks. An older man, likely a retired warrior, watched them intently, offering corrections and advice where needed. His grizzled appearance suggested he had seen his fair share of battles, though his age hadn't diminished the sharpness in his eyes. Next to him lay two large dogs, one with smoky gray fur and piercing yellow eyes, the other white as snow with striking red eyes. I watched for a moment, taking in the scene. Winterfell, with its ancient walls and enduring traditions, felt alive in a way that few places did. The past, present, and future seemed to coexist here, woven together in the stone, the people, and the land itself. I turned away from those familiar red eyes. Red always reminded me of someone I'd rather forget. Before me, two boys sparred intensely. The first had auburn hair and blue eyes, strong and solid in his build, while the second, with dark brown hair and gray eyes, was lean and quick, relying on agility more than brute strength. They traded blows with determined ferocity, neither willing to back down. I couldn't help but smirk. Though I had no formal training in swordsmanship, I knew I could easily take them both down. A voice interrupted my thoughts. Not good enough for you, huh? A young man, maybe 18 or 19, stood to my right. He sounded arrogant. You think you can do better? I glanced at him. I don't think I can do better, I replied, letting him smile smugly for a second before continuing. I know I can. The smirk vanished from his face. Prove it then, he barked loudly, catching the attention of the sparring boys at an older warrior watching over them and a few passers-by. A duel between us. Let's see if you're as skilled as you claim. I frowned slightly. One should offer their name before issuing a challenge. Theon of House Greyjoy he said proudly, straightening up as if that should impress me. And you? Harry of House Potter, I responded casually, fully aware that my name would mean nothing to anyone here. House Potter? Theon sneered. Some forgotten southern family of potters? Actually, I'm from the east, I corrected. And no, we don't make pots, we make swords, 
He eyed my weapon. You made that sword then? Looks a bit small, doesn't it? It's not the size of the sword that matters, I replied with condescension that I knew would irritate him. It's the skill of the one holding it. The older warrior chuckled, drawing both our attention. Well said, lad. So are you ready for a fight? I nodded, making my way to the center of the sparring area as the two boys eagerly stepped aside. It seemed watching a match was just as exciting as participating in one. I laid my sword on the ground, and one of the boys tossed me a wooden practice sword while the other handed one to Theon. We squared off, standing only a few feet apart. Theon gave me a cocky grin, clearly confident in his victory. He was older, bigger, and likely assumed he had more experience. The old warrior called out, Ready? We both nodded. Begin! Theon lunged at me immediately, his strike aimed at intimidating me into submission. I could tell he expected to overwhelm me with his speed and aggression, but I simply sidestepped his attack, and as he stumbled forward, I slapped him hard on the rear. He yelped, losing his balance and falling face first into the dirt. The two boys erupted in laughter, and even the older warrior allowed a brief smirk to cross his face before returning to his usual stern expression. Theon, red-faced with embarrassment, climbed back to his feet without a word and attacked again. He had earned some respect for not backing down, but I still intended to thoroughly defeat him. I dodged and parried his strikes, blocking where necessary, but never retaliating. As the fight dragged on, it became clear to him that I wasn't taking it seriously, and frustration set in. His swings grew more erratic, missing even when I stood still. Fight back, you coward, he shouted, wildly swinging again. That was the moment I was waiting for. In a single fluid motion, I blocked his strike, swept his legs out from under him, and placed my practice sword against his throat as he hit the ground. He looked up at me, fury in his eyes, but there was nothing he could do. Do you yield? I asked, my voice calm and deliberate. A tense few moments passed before Theon muttered, Yes, I yield. I withdrew my sword and extended a hand to help him up. He hesitated, but eventually took it, standing and brushing the dust off. You're really good. A small voice called out. It was the young girl I had noticed earlier, watching from the sidelines with bright eyes. Theon scowled at her but said nothing, handing the practice swords back to the older man. I smiled at her. I think Theon took it easy on me, I said, playing it down. That seemed to soothe Theon's bruised ego, though the others looked at me with disbelief. The older warrior, however, understood my intent. The girl frowned at being called little, but it only amused me further. Kids always had a way of getting under my skin in the most entertaining ways. Anyway, I said, retrieving my sword, I apologize for interrupting your training. I'm sure your students would like to continue. It felt strange speaking so formally, but I figured the language of my own world would confuse them more than anything. Think nothing of it, er. The older warrior trailed off, unsure how to address me. Harry is fine, I said with a smile, shaking his hand. His grip was firm. I'm no lord, just a traveler passing through. Sir Roderick Castle, the man, introduced himself. Master at arms of Winterfell. Master at arms? That explained why someone of his status was training a group of children. I glanced at the kids, then back at Sir Roderick, feeling slightly uneasy. Don't worry, lad, he said, clapping a hand on my shoulder. No one gets punished for winning fairly. Good, I replied, relieved. That's good, thank you. It wouldn't have been ideal to fight my way out of here if the local lord's children took offense to losing. Sir Roderick then introduced me to the rest of the group, and we exchanged pleasantries. The auburn-haired boy was Rob Stark, heir to Winterfell. The other boy was Jon Snow, labeled a bastard, a term that clearly bothered him. I could tell Jon expected me to judge him, but I shook his hand with a grin and suggested we spar later. His surprise turned to a smile. I'll hold you to that, Jon said with a nod. The girl, who was still frowning at me, was Arya Stark. She seemed particularly irritated when I called her Little Lady. Kids, always so easy to rile up. The two young boys introduced themselves as Bran and Rickon Stark, their youthful energy evident as they taunted their sister. I greeted them with a warm smile and exchanged a few pleasantries, observing their playful banter. May I ask what brings you so far north? The old knight inquired, his gaze steady as he settled the boys down. I heard rumors at Torren Square that the king is riding to Winterfell with his court, I replied, keeping my tone casual. 
I. That's true, the knight acknowledged, a hint of amusement in his eyes as Arya's voice rang out, berating her brothers for calling her little lady. So you're here to witness the king's arrival? Yes, I said, glancing towards a particular tree with crimson leaves that stood out against the landscape. I'm also interested in that tree over there. The knight's eyes followed my gesture, landing on the treetop. The weirwood, you mean? He asked. Indeed. I've come across stories of the old gods during my travels, and I'm curious to learn more, I explained. Is it permissible to explore the godswood? Of course. Of course, lad, the knight said without hesitation. The godswood is open to all, forgive an old man's curiosity. I nodded in acknowledgement. No offense taken. Before I could depart, he added, just remember... The godswood is a place of reverence. Show it the respect it deserves. The underlying message was clear. Desecration would not be tolerated. I assured him, I understand, and bid farewell to the children with a special nod to John. As I made my way to the godswood, Erebus spoke in my mind, his voice tinged with skepticism. Not quite what I expected from the sons of noblemen. Navigating the godswood felt like stepping into a different world, far denser than any garden I had imagined. The air was thick with an ancient presence, and the trees stood tall, forming a canopy that filtered the sunlight into a patchwork of shadows and light. The weirwood tree itself loomed ahead, its white bark almost glowing, and its red leaves rustling like whispers in the wind. The tree exuded a subtle, pulsing energy, a magic barely perceptible yet undeniably present. It seemed to be confined within the boundaries of the grove, as though the earth itself held it in check. As I approached, a voice cut through the silence. Who are you? Emerging from behind the massive trunk was a man in his mid-thirties, his face weathered, his eyes a stormy gray that spoke of hard-won experience. Clad in furs and bearing a broad sword as imposing as he was, he exuded authority. There was something about the weapon, a heat that seemed to emanate from it, as if it held a life of its own. Stay alert, Erebus murmured in my thoughts, his tone a subtle warning. My apologies, I said, forcing myself to remain composed. I was drawn to the weirwood, first time seeing one in person, and I couldn't resist. My name is Harry. The man inclined his head slightly. I am Eddard Stark, Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. Oh, great, I thought. I just stumbled upon the Lord of the place. Trying to regain my composure, I blurted out, do you always have to say the full title every time? To my surprise, a faint smile tugged at the corners of his mouth. I, lad, even after all these years, it's still a bit of a mouthful. I can imagine, I replied, then turned back to the tree. Eddard followed my gaze. Magnificent, isn't it? Absolutely, I agreed. I've read that the children of the forest carved faces into these trees. That they did, Eddard confirmed, gesturing for me to follow him. As I rounded the tree, I came face to face with the carved visage, its eyes seemingly weeping red sap. It was eerily lifelike. They say no man can tell a lie before a heart tree. Eddard continued, his voice reverent. The old gods know when men are false. I placed a hand on the bark, sensing a faint consciousness, an awareness that lingered just out of reach, like a shape glimpsed from the corner of one's eye. It was a reminder of the mysteries that lay beyond human understanding, proof of forces older than civilization. After a moment, I drew back and spoke. A remarkable place indeed. I apologize for disturbing your contemplation. I'll take my leave now. Good day, Lord Stark. Good day, he replied, inclining his head before resuming his meditative posture beneath the tree. With that, I made my way to the town just outside Winterfell's walls, where the inn known as the Smoking Log awaited. The inn's name, I learned, came from the warm steam that drifted from the nearby hot springs, creating a kind of perpetual mist that hung over the area. The town was sparsely populated, the bustling marketplace, a shadow of what it must be during the depths of winter, when the small folk flocked here seeking refuge from the cold. Among the sights that caught my eye was the brothel. I briefly entertained the idea of visiting, but quickly dismissed it, no telling what kind of ailments the women might carry. These people were unfamiliar with even the most basic principles of hygiene, let alone the concept of disease prevention. Better safe than sorry, I reasoned. The room I rented was modest, but sufficient for my needs. I paid for a few weeks in advance, unsure of when King Robert and his retinue would arrive. I wasn't entirely certain why I was so interested in meeting him. 
After all, he was just a man like any other. But something about the North and its ancient, whispering trees left me with a sense that there was more at play here than met the eye. One man who rules over all these lands, Erebus corrected me, his voice tinged with curiosity. At the very least, it will be interesting to see what kind of man he is. Over the next week, while waiting for the king's arrival, I spent my time diving into a book I'd purchased in Torhens Square, which detailed the history of old Valyria. Once the center of a vast empire, Valyria now lay in ruins on the eastern continent of Essos, a city lost to time after a mysterious and catastrophic event known as the Doom. The Valyrian freehold had spanned much of the continent, its people renowned for their mastery of dragons and magic. But in a single day, it all came to an end, save for the Targaryen family, who managed to escape before the disaster struck. The book, while informative, left much to be desired in terms of specifics. What exactly caused the doom remained a mystery. Was it volcanic eruptions that tore the land apart? Or something darker? Perhaps their own dragons turned against them, or they fell victim to some unknown force? The speculation was endless, but one thing was clear. Magic had been deeply woven into Valyrian society, bound by fire and blood. Their wizards were said to perform feats like igniting candles made of dragon glass, which supposedly allowed them to see across vast distances, peer into the minds of others, and communicate across continents. The remnants of such power still lingered, hinting at a world once much more connected to the supernatural than the present. I guess Valyria should be on the list of places to visit, I mused after finishing the book. The thought of exploring such ancient ruins intrigued me, though I knew that few ever returned from the cursed land. In the meantime, I had begun sparring with Jon Snow, his half-brother Rob, and Theon Greyjoy. Though all three were skilled, I found myself gravitating toward Jon. Rob and Theon were brash, especially Greyjoy, whose arrogance often grated on my nerves. Jon, by contrast, carried a quiet intensity. His emotions were guarded, his demeanor resembling that of his father, Eddard Stark, stern, composed, and observant. I sensed why John was so closed off. As a bastard, he was an outsider, even within his own home. Society viewed bastards with suspicion, labeling them as opportunistic and untrustworthy, largely due to the infamous Blackfire Rebellion a century ago. Back then, King Aegon legitimized all his bastards on his deathbed, but they eventually rebelled, seeking the crown for themselves. Since then, the stigma around bastards had only grown worse. Maybe that's why I found myself drawn to John. He wasn't arrogant or entitled like Theon, and beneath his quiet exterior, I saw someone who had lived with rejection his whole life, much like I had. Growing up under the Dursley's roof, I'd been treated with disdain, never truly feeling like I belonged. I understood the pain of wondering about your parents in the dead of night, yearning for answers that never came. In John, I saw a kindred spirit, someone who, despite his burdens, held on to his honor and his kindness. In the short time we had spent together, we had become friends, a bond forged in unspoken understanding. One evening, John opened up to me about his desire to join the Night's Watch, an idea that had been weighing heavily on his mind for over a year. You can't be serious, I said, raising an eyebrow. The Night's Watch is practically a prison for criminals. John's face tightened at my words. My Uncle Benjen is part of the Night's Watch, and he's no criminal. I'm sure he's not, I quickly reassured him. But let's be honest, most of their recruits are criminals. They're sent there as an alternative to losing their heads. I recounted the story of the thief I'd encountered in Torhin's Square, a man who had begged for his life, knowing that his choices were either the chopping block or taking the black. The Night's Watch recruits from dungeons and prisons all over the realm. It's a last resort for many who'd rather die than spend their lives in a cold, desolate place, stripped of their freedom. John remained silent, clearly grappling with the weight of my words. I softened my tone, sensing his inner conflict. Look, I know your uncle is an honorable man, and so are you. But you're still young, John. There's so much more you could do before committing your life to the watch. And what would you have me do? John's voice rose, frustration lacing his words. I'm a bastard. No one will take me in except the watch. I would. My voice was steady, and John looked at me in surprise. I don't care that you're a bastard. What matters is the kind of person you are, and from what I've seen, you're one of the best. 
You treat people with kindness, even when the world hasn't been kind to you. John looked away, clearly moved by my words, but still unsure. The compliment had made him visibly uncomfortable, but I could tell it struck a chord. I'll be heading to the wall soon, I added, trying to lighten the mood. I've heard it's an impressive sight, and I'd like to see it for myself. You could come with me, at least visit the wall before deciding if it's where you want to spend your life. What do you say? John hesitated for a long moment before nodding. All right, he said, though there was still a touch of reluctance in his voice. When the time comes, we'll go, if only to see what it's really like. The rest of the evening passed in comfortable silence, the weight of the conversation still lingering between us but with a newfound understanding. A week and a half had passed since I agreed to accompany Jon Snow to the wall after sizing up the king. Oddly enough, the king had yet to arrive, but it made sense. Moving an entire entourage took far more time, far more time than a lone rider. The logistics of transporting a royal retinue full of soldiers and attendants no doubt slowed them down. I figured it could easily take another week or more for them to catch up. During this time, I settled into a routine. Mornings were reserved for sparring with John, sometimes joined by his half-brother, Rob. The sessions with John were particularly intense. We clashed blow after blow while Sir Roderick, Winterfell's master-at-arms, kept a watchful eye on our progress. While I could have easily bested John, just as I had Theon Greyjoy, I chose not to. The point wasn't to dominate. I needed to build real skill. You might wonder, why not use all your power, Harry? Surely you could win every fight. True, I could enhance my speed and reflexes by channeling my lightning, making me nearly untouchable. But here's the thing. Real battles are rarely one-on-one. -on -one. In an ambush or surrounded by multiple enemies, speed alone wouldn't save me. Imagine facing 50 men, my comrades dead in the first 10 seconds. I'm left against a handful of attackers in close quarters, while dozens more prepare to strike, archers knocking arrows from a distance. Sure, I could dodge a few strikes, but eventually I'd either be overwhelmed by arrows or cut down by swords. Even if I relied on my wide area magic like lightning dragons roar or other devastating spells, I'd run out of energy fast. My powers weren't limitless. They ebbed with fatigue, hunger, and stress. Another complication I'd noticed was how this world seemed to suppress my magic's full potential. My abilities could still break through stone and metal, but not with the ease they once had. The magic here resisted mine, forcing me to adapt, hence my focus on swordplay. John had natural talent, his strikes were precise, his counters timed perfectly, and as we sparred, I found myself improving. In the beginning, John could easily beat me, but over time, I made him work for his victories. The sound of a scuffle nearby snapped me back to the present. I turned and smiled at the sight. John was wrestling with his direwolf, Ghost. Despite his massive size, Ghost moved in eerie silence, each step noiseless, unlike his siblings. There was something mysterious about Ghost, perhaps a magical trait unique to him. I made a mental note to look into it later. It was almost noon, the time when John and I usually sat outside Winterfell, overlooking the distant woods. The landscape here was breathtaking, so much more vibrant than the world I had left behind. I had come to enjoy these quiet moments with John, sitting in companionable silence, sharing lunch after our training sessions. He had begun to open up to me a little since I promised to take him with me to the wall, and perhaps even further if the Night's Watch didn't live up to his expectations. Though John wasn't the type to bear his soul, he had started to smile more easily. He shared bits of himself, not through words, but through his actions, how he interacted with others, how he carried himself. With most people, John remained guarded, his words careful, his distance evident. But with his siblings, especially Arya, he let down his guard. It was clear she idolized him. He treated her with a respect that others often overlooked. John had also begun to probe me with subtle questions. He wasn't direct, but he wanted to know if I truly meant it when I offered him a place by my side. He was testing me, assessing if my offer of companionship was genuine. I couldn't blame him. His questions were sharp, especially when he asked what my plans were. That was a question I couldn't easily answer. I had originally come to this world with a clear goal. Find magical artifacts, harness their power, and find a way home. But as time passed, the plan started to feel less concrete, more like a distant hope. 
This world's magic, while powerful, was different from the structured magic of my home. Back there, spells were crafted through careful calculation and theory. Arithmancy laid the foundation for creating new spells, each formula meticulously designed. Here, magic felt raw, untamed. There was no familiar structure to it, no clear method of control. Back home, creating a spell was like solving a puzzle. Break down the desired effect into a series of steps, link them together, and voila, a spell that could cook your dinner or heal wounds. But here, magic felt more like a force of nature, unpredictable and elusive. I had told John that if he joined me, I'd share my plans with him to explore the world in search of magical artifacts, ones that might hold the key to returning me home. But truthfully, I wasn't even sure of that anymore. What I had once considered an easy path now felt like chasing shadows. The more I learned about this world, the more I doubted that it held the answers I was seeking. The future, once so clear, now seemed like an open road with endless possibilities, but no destination. And maybe I thought that wasn't such a bad thing. The study of magic often evokes a fascination with structure and theory. Arithmancy and ancient runes, for example, embodying the intricate systems that underpin spellcraft. In arithmancy, complex calculations allow wizards to discern patterns in the magical world, while the ancient practice of inscribing runes channels protective magic through wood, stone, or bone with remarkable precision. Transfiguration, although seemingly straightforward as the art of changing one object into another, proves deceptively intricate. Each transformation demands extensive understanding, as evidenced by the exhaustive essays required to master even the simplest spells. Yet, in this world, the magic appears less codified and more elusive. The practitioners, shadowbinders, warlocks, and red priests, rely on arcane rituals rooted in fire and blood. These practices are not organized into structured disciplines like in my world, but are shrouded in myth and ritual, lacking the clear framework I was accustomed to. It was a stark contrast to the rigor of magical studies, where rules governed every spell. My informal lessons with Meister Lewin became a window into both history and magic. Despite his skepticism toward the supernatural, Lewin was well-versed in the lore surrounding the Red Priests, who worshipped Erlor, the Lord of Light. The faith taught that Erlor's eternal struggle was against the Great Other, a dark force embodying death, cold, and evil. During one of our conversations, Lewin spoke about the duality of these beliefs, light versus dark, fire against ice. I considered the nature of these supposed deities, who seemed familiar from my own encounters with the forces beyond the veil. The Great Other had reacted with shock to my command over darkness and cold, while Arlor regarded me as an adversary. Their very recognition of me hinted at an enmity I had yet to fully understand. Turning our discussions to politics revealed a society built on stark inequalities. Lords wielded near-absolute power over the land and its people, while the king's authority, although theoretically supreme, often depended on the influence of noble families. I likened it to the wizarding world's own flaws, where wealth and power could corrupt justice. When I raised this point, Lewin's knowing smile suggested agreement. It is an imperfect system, he admitted, but one preferable to chaos and civil strife. The more I learned, the more I saw how deeply entrenched the hierarchy was. Unlike my own time, where rights and freedoms had been hard won through centuries of struggle, here the notion of equality seemed almost absurd. The people, small folk as they were called, were viewed as little more than chattel by some, their worth measured in their utility to the nobility. Such a system conflicted with my beliefs. Despite my powers, I did not consider myself inherently superior to others. I could not accept a world where birth alone determined a person's value. It was tempting to consider using my magic to impose change, to bend the powerful to my will through enchantment or force. But such a course would be unsustainable. The imperious curse, though effective, could be resisted by those with strong enough minds and attempting to control many people simultaneously would only lead to failure. Meaningful change, I knew, could not be achieved solely through coercion. The tranquility of the godswood often provided a welcome respite from my inner turmoil. Its ancient trees, dense and gnarled, bore witness to the passage of time, their roots seemingly intertwined with the very history of the north. The heart tree, with its haunting visage carved into the bark, exuded an aura that was almost tangible, 
a quiet power that filled the air like a whispered secret. I felt the magic here, old and enduring, unlike any I had encountered before. It was not the raw, chaotic energy of spell work, but something deeper, a connection to the land itself. As I touched the bark, I felt a presence, distant yet palpable, as though the tree itself was aware of my thoughts. I couldn't help but wonder if the old gods, whoever or whatever they were, listened to the murmurs of the heart tree and watched through its eyes. It was said that no one could lie in front of a heart tree, as if the ancient deities saw through all pretense. The idea intrigued me, and I resolved to explore this magic further, to understand whether it was truly divine or simply another facet of the world's hidden mysteries. My reflections were interrupted by John's sudden approach. His face, usually composed, showed a hint of nervousness. My father has invited you to join us for dinner, he said, the words tinged with uncertainty. The invitation came as a surprise. Really? I asked, glancing around as if expecting some jest. John nodded. Lady Catelyn was against it, but my father insisted. The gesture felt significant, a sign that Lord Stark saw me as more than just an outsider. His willingness to include me, despite his wife's disapproval, hinted at a deeper sense of fairness. The respect he showed toward his son, despite the murmurs behind John's back, revealed a man who upheld his values even when society's conventions dictated otherwise. As I followed John, I found myself hoping that Eddard Stark's integrity extended further than most men's. The dinner invitation was more than an opportunity to share a meal. It was a glimpse into the family dynamics that shaped Winterfell. Catelyn's coldness contrasted sharply with Eddard's quiet acceptance, and I could see how John's mixed status had left him caught between two worlds. In this ancient stronghold, steeped in tradition, where power flowed through bloodlines and allegiances, the question of where I belonged remained unresolved. The old structures were resilient, but I wondered if there might be room for something new to emerge within the cracks. It was enough to leave a sour taste in my mouth, I muttered after a moment of silence. But yes, I finally agreed. I'll go. John's shoulders visibly relaxed, and Ghost, his dire wolf, trotted over to my side. The wolf gave a curious glance at my covered arm before settling down at my feet. I absently patted his head, my gaze drifting to the distant wolf's wood, lost in thought as time slipped by unnoticed. Minutes turned into hours as the forest's silhouette faded into the approaching dusk. Eventually, John spoke again, his voice quiet. We should probably head in for dinner. You go ahead, I replied with a small smile. I'll catch up. It's in the Great Hall, right? He nodded, and with a lingering look, he left me to my thoughts. As I continued to stare into the woods, Erebus, ever the silent observer, finally broke the quiet. You know, he said, his voice low and almost cautious, I don't think we're going back. I didn't need to ask what he meant. I'd felt it too, the growing certainty that this world wasn't just a stop along the way, but a permanent change. I nodded, not taking my eyes off the trees. The thought has crossed my mind, but there's still a chance. Maybe the wall, or the Isle of Faces could have some answers. Erebus surprised me then. I've spoken to the heart tree, he admitted. It's ancient, and though its magic is faint, it still remembers. The world's magic is almost gone now except for you. The tree said your power surpasses even that of the children of the forest. I stood still, absorbing that. And what does that mean for us? I asked, frustrated. What are we supposed to do with that information? Start over, Erebus said simply. We could make this world our own. How? I challenged, feeling a surge of bitterness. Where do I even begin? You've already laid the groundwork, Erebus replied. You've passed as the son of a wealthy family. You have the resources to shape a future here, to forge a new path. What do you really want, though? His question hung in the air, and my thoughts turned to the people I'd left behind. Sirius, Daphne, the world I'd once fought for. I had stopped the Demon Emperor, but Voldemort was still alive, still a threat in that world. Sooner or later, those I cared about would face him, and I wouldn't be there. A knot tightened in my chest, and the helplessness of it all threatened to overwhelm me. The worst part was knowing I could do nothing. But Balthazar, always blunt, chimed in. Sirius isn't a fool. You saw how he fought those demons. He's got Remus and Dumbledore, too. They can handle it. Uh, I exhaled, trying to release the tension. You're right. 
Without the Horcrux in my head, they'll have a much easier time finding and destroying the rest. They might not even need me for that final battle. As powerful as Voldemort was, he was no match for the combined strength of those three. If anyone could finish him, it was them. You have to let them go, Erebus said softly. We can't change what's already happening there. We have to move forward now. I closed my eyes, letting the weight of his words settle. After a long pause, I stood, a slow but deliberate movement that felt like a final decision. It was time to let go. Everything I had known, my friends, my family, uh, my world, it was all gone. But I was still here, in a new world with new possibilities. Maybe it was time to embrace that. With renewed purpose, I walked back toward Winterfell, exchanging brief greetings with the familiar faces I'd come to know. I stopped by the stables, feeding Garyon before greeting Hodor with a smile. My steps carried me past the smithy, the sept, and finally toward the imposing doors of the Great Hall. Inside, the chill of the evening was replaced by the warmth of a roaring fire. John was already waiting near the entrance. Good, you made it, he said, looking a bit sheepish. I forgot to close the door when I came in. I chuckled. No worries, everyone's already here? He nodded. Yeah, they're all waiting inside. I took a deep breath, feeling a bit nervous. Let's get this over with. John led me into the large dining room, the hall echoing with the sounds of conversation and clinking silverware. The space was vast, filled with long rows of trestle tables that could seat hundreds. At the head of the room, raised above the rest, were the seats of honor where the Starks were already gathered. As we approached, I took in the scene. Arya was her usual energetic self, playfully teasing Rickon and Bran, while a slightly older girl, Sansa, by the looks of her, watched with a mixture of irritation and amusement. Nearby, Rob sat quietly, listening to Theon, who was deep into some lively monologue. Maester Lewin and Lord Eddard were at the far end, engaged in quiet conversation, while Lady Catelyn's eyes flicked toward us as we entered. The hall quieted as John stepped forward. Lord Stark... Lady Stark, he greeted formally, his tone respectful yet reserved. John, Lord Stark replied warmly, while Lady Catelyn gave a polite nod, though her expression remained guarded. May I introduce Harry Potter of Mir? John gestured toward me. I bowed slightly in greeting. It's a pleasure to meet you, Lady Stark. Lord Stark, I said, my gaze briefly catching Sansa's, whose eyes widened in surprise. Lord Stark smiled and gestured to the table. Please, join us. Thank you, I said, taking a seat next to John, close enough to the Starks to join their conversation, but still positioned with the younger members of the family. As I settled in, I nodded to Maester Lewin. Good evening, Maester Lewin. Harry, Lewin replied with a small smile. You two know each other? Lord Stark asked, a note of surprise in his voice. Yes, Lewin said, still smiling. We happened upon each other in the library. Harry was reading a rather extensive tome on history. Ah, yes, I confirmed with a slight chuckle. I think I kept him talking about it longer than I intended. Lewin chuckled in return. Indeed, I was nearly late to my duties. As the conversation shifted, I realized something. I was no longer just a guest in Winterfell. Slowly but surely, I was becoming part of this world. And maybe, just maybe, that was something worth embracing. Eddard's eyes flickered with recognition as he spoke. Aye, you were. I had just assumed you had other matters to attend to. Lewin shifted, looking slightly embarrassed, but Eddard offered him a small, reassuring smile. No need to worry, old friend. These things happen. Lewin gave a brief nod and returned to his meal. Turning to me, Eddard continued, So, Harry, what brings you to Westeros? I noticed Lady Catelyn's gaze shift to me as well, intrigued by the question. Well, Lord Stark, I began, I've been traveling the world, seeking a place to settle down and leave my mark. Westeros seemed like a fine choice, and the North has been mostly wonderful so far. Mostly? Lady Catelyn asked, her tone curious, but with a slight edge of disapproval. I grimaced slightly before responding. A few brigands tried to rob me near Torren Square. My lady, I added quickly, realizing my lack of formalities. Apologies, I'm still adjusting to the customs here. It's quite all right, Lord Stark replied, his expression kind. Did you report the matter to the authorities? I didn't, I admitted, and immediately felt the weight of curious stares fall on me. Why not? John, seated next to me, asked, his brow furrowing. The other Stark children were also listening closely. I took a deep breath before explaining. They looked like they were starving. 
I'm fortunate enough to have resources from my parents, but not everyone is that lucky. I beat their leader and let them go. Eddard nodded thoughtfully. A merciful choice. Thank you, Lord Stark, I replied as the servants began to bring out dinner. The spread was far from the extravagant dishes I had half expected. No whole pigs with apples in their mouths, thankfully, but a simple array of meats, bread, and vegetables. I reached for some venison, a meat I had developed a taste for in my time here. After a few bites, Eddard asked, If you don't mind my curiosity, how old are you? I swallowed before answering. Fifteen. Fifteen, Lady Catelyn said, her surprise evident. And you're already traveling? Your parents permitted this? The question hit a nerve. My response came out colder than I intended. They were killed when I was young. I left as soon as I could. My memories of that place were... tainted. My condolences, Lady Catelyn offered, clearly flustered by her misstep. Her voice softened, and she looked genuinely sorry. It's all right, I said, my tone more forgiving. Arya, chewing on her food, suddenly asked, Is that why you're here? Arya, Catelyn scolded, don't speak with your mouth full. I chuckled lightly, answering the young Stark, Yes, that's part of it. I've come here to start a new life. You plan to form your own house, then? Maester Lewin inquired, his eyes narrowing in interest. I paused, considering the question. Maybe someday, I said, choosing my words carefully. For now, I'm focused on making a name for myself. Without a reputation, I couldn't possibly hope to gain land or trust from others. Quite true, Lewin agreed, as Eddard gave a nod of approval. But how do you intend to achieve that? Lewin asked, leaning in. I've only figured out part of it, I admitted with a sheepish grin. Once people know my name, they'll see what kind of man I am. As for land, well, I have the means at least. Hmm, Lewin murmured thoughtfully. And your plan for gaining this notoriety? I smiled. By defeating the strongest fighters in Westeros, of course. That should get people talking. The room fell into an awkward silence, broken only by Theon's sudden snort of laughter. That's a bit arrogant, don't you think? Theon remarked, clearly dismissive. You bested me in a spar, I'll give you that. But do you honestly think you can take on anyone? I met his gaze steadily. Yes. John remained silent, though I noticed a flicker of recognition in his eyes. He had seen glimpses of my true power, though he didn't know the full extent of it. Theon smirked, leaning back in his chair. I've heard Sir Jaime Lannister, the Kingslayer himself, is coming to Winterfell with the King. Would you challenge him then? Jaime Lannister. His reputation as one of the best swordsmen in the Seven Kingdoms preceded him. The servants and small folk in Wintertown spoke of his skill often, and it was clear that Theon expected me to shy away from such a challenge. Is that so? I replied calmly, watching Theon's face for a reaction. Oh yes, Theon continued, clearly enjoying the moment. He likely thought he had cornered me. Then yes, I said, a grin spreading across my face. I'll challenge him once he's settled in. Will you deliver the challenge for me? or shall I do it myself? Theon had no response, his earlier confidence suddenly faltering. John and Rob exchanged amused glances, while the adults at the table looked at me like I had lost my mind. I could already tell the next few days were going to be eventful. But for now, I focused on the meal in front of me. This venison was particularly excellent. A week passed with each day blending into the next, marked by sparring sessions and long hours of practice. John and I had been training in earnest, pushing the limits of our speed and reflexes. John had shown remarkable improvement, his movements growing faster and more precise. He had even begun to outmatch some of Winterfell's seasoned guards, a testament to the effectiveness of our grueling regime. But it wasn't just the swordplay that we focused on. I took John through exercises that seemed foreign here, push-ups, squats, Drills designed to build strength and endurance beyond what lugging a sword or wearing armor could achieve. It had worked wonders for him, even if we kept the details of his new routine to ourselves to avoid questions. During this time, I also ventured into the Wolf's Wood to explore the full extent of my magic's power. I conjured lightning, shaping it into orbs, sharp-edged forms, and weapons. I unleashed its energy on a boulder, shattering it and toppling several trees in the process, Yet, despite the display, there was a nagging sensation that the magic wasn't quite as potent as it used to be. It behaved differently here, subject to this world's peculiarities. Be grateful the magic still flows, Erebus had noted. Without it, 
your body would not have endured the transition. I had no reason to argue. Power was power, even if it seemed to respond to different rules. There were no battle mages here as far as I knew, no sorcerers wielding magic in the direct and explosive ways that I had grown accustomed to. From what I gathered, those who practiced magic, if they could even be called that, relied on rituals and ancient rites steeped in superstition rather than the sheer force I could muster. But that was a concern for another time. John's progress was evident to anyone who paid attention. His skills were advancing so rapidly that even Rob, who joined our training sessions occasionally, couldn't help but notice the results. Though it amused me to see how training methods taken for granted in my world were unheard of here, John embraced them with a zeal that spoke of a desire to prove himself. It was as if he needed to prove he belonged, not just as a Stark in all but name, but as someone who could exceed the expectations placed upon him. Our latest bout came to an abrupt halt as a woman's frantic voice echoed across the courtyard. We turned to see Lady Catelyn and Maester Lewin, both looking up at one of the castle walls. Following their gaze, we saw Bran climbing down like a squirrel from branch to branch. Bran, how many times must I tell you? Lady Catelyn called out, her tone a mixture of worry and frustration. No climbing, but the king's coming! Bran exclaimed excitedly as he dropped onto a thatched roof and began his descent. There are hundreds with him. Despite her scolding, there was a hint of relief in her eyes when he reached the ground safely. John watched the exchange with a resigned shake of his head, but his attention soon returned to me, a mischievous glint in his eye. I suppose I'll spare you the embarrassment of losing today, John quipped, sheathing his practice sword. Oh, how gracious! I retorted as the news of the king's arrival swept through Winterfell. Everyone scrambled to their posts. Guards took up positions, stable boys prepared the horses, and nobles gathered in clusters. Go on, I said, giving John a slight nudge. Join your family. I'll figure out where I'm supposed to stand. He nodded gratefully and disappeared into the crowd. For a moment, I just stood there, taking in the chaotic energy of the castle. This wasn't just any visit. It was a grand event that set everyone on edge. I was considering where to station myself when a familiar voice called out. Harry, said Lord Eddard Stark, clad in formal attire befitting the Lord of Winterfell. Why are you just standing there? Caught off guard, I gestured toward the bustle. Not entirely sure where I'm supposed to be, I admitted. Come with me, then. He beckoned for me to follow. You can stand by Maester Lewin. Are you sure? I hesitated, unsure if it was appropriate. I'm not family. From what I understand, you may become John's mentor or something close to it. That ties you to this household more than you realize. The unexpected sentiment left me a bit uneasy, but I nodded. Very well, if you insist. Eddard gave a slight smile. We will discuss that matter in greater depth later, he said, and then strode away to greet the arriving guests. I took my place beside Maester Lewin and John, catching Lady Catelyn's disapproving glance. She didn't say anything, but the look she shot at my untamed hair spoke volumes. I merely shrugged, offering a faint smile as if to say, What can you do? As the anticipation in the air thickened, the sound of hooves reached us, and the royal procession emerged from the dust cloud. At its head was a boy with golden hair, riding confidently ahead his retinue of white-cloaked guards making it clear he was no ordinary visitor. A prince had arrived. A new rider caught my attention as he followed closely behind the prince, a massive man clad in black armor with a helmet shaped like a snarling hound's head that obscured his face. The sight was intimidating, and I found myself instinctively keeping my distance. As I glanced in the direction of the prince, I noticed Sansa gazing at him, her expression dreamy, clearly smitten. Maybe this crush of hers would finally take her mind off me. The past week had been unsettling. Everywhere I turned, she was there, eager for walks or conversations. Each time, I managed to come up with an excuse, usually involving teaching John something about combat. She'd believed every word, imagining me as some kind of noble knight in shining armor. In hindsight, my evasions may have only fueled her fascination. I pushed these thoughts aside as another large carriage approached, escorted by more Kingsguard. From within, a rotund man dressed in deep red leathers, the same shade as the prince's, appeared. As the carriage stopped, servants rushed to position a small wooden staircase so he could dismount. 
I couldn't help but stare in disbelief as the man, who I now realized was the king, struggled to get off his horse. This is the king of Westeros? I thought, incredulously watching the scene unfold. He waddled over to the still-kneeling Eddard Stark, towering over him in silence for a few tense moments before gesturing for him to rise. Eddard stood, and the rest of us followed suit, the king still quiet as he examined his old friend. Your grace, Lord Stark greeted him with a short bow of his head. The king looked him up and down, the tension thick in the air, before finally breaking the silence with a blunt observation. You've gotten fat. I nearly lost it then, stifling a laugh as best I could. Lord Stark's eyes flicked down briefly to the king's massive gut before Robert broke into a booming laugh, pulling Eddard into a bear hug. The tension eased and the mood lightened as the king also embraced Lady Catelyn with a few polite words. It's been nine years, Ned, King Robert said as he stepped back. Where have you been hiding? Why haven't we seen each other? Guarding the north for you, your grace, Eddard responded. Winterfell is yours, as ever. As they exchanged pleasantries, the carriage door creaked open once more, and out stepped a beautiful blonde woman, her disheveled appearance doing little to diminish her regal bearing. She surveyed the surroundings with barely concealed disdain, as though being in the north was beneath her. That must be the queen, I thought, recognizing her from descriptions. Arya suddenly asked, her voice loud and curious as she scanned the crowd. Will you be quiet? Sansa snapped, clearly embarrassed by her younger sister's outburst. The imp, I thought, but before I could dwell on it, King Robert moved to greet the children. He shook Rob's hand firmly. You must be Rob, he said with approval, before turning to Sansa and offering a compliment on her appearance. His eyes then settled on Arya with a curious glint. And who might you be? Arya, she replied immediately, meeting his gaze without a hint of fear. I couldn't tell if she was fearless or just lacking in caution, but her boldness seemed to amuse the king. My attention shifted to one of the king's guard, who had removed his helmet, revealing golden hair that matched the queen's. Arya, ever observant, spoke up again. That's Jaime Lannister, the queen's brother. Would you please stop talking? Sansa hissed, her frustration growing. So that's him, I murmured to myself, watching as John also glanced toward Jaime Lannister. There was something in John's posture, a mix of tension and recognition. As Eddard and Catelyn greeted the queen, King Robert, ever impatient, interrupted. Take me to your crypt, he demanded, his tone leaving no room for argument. I want to pay my respects. We've been riding for over a month, my love, Queen Cersei interjected, her voice laced with irritation. Surely the dead can wait? But King Robert paid her no heed, turning to Ned with a simple nod before walking off toward the crypt. After a brief hesitation, Eddard followed him, leaving the rest of us standing awkwardly in the courtyard. Lady Catelyn took charge then, directing the servants to prepare accommodations for the royal guests as the castle buzzed with activity. I turned to John, who had been quiet throughout. Want to get back to training? I asked. We can probably squeeze in another hour before I have to get ready for the feast. John nodded, eager for the distraction. I knew how much it frustrated him to be excluded from the feast because of his status as a bastard. It angered me too, but there was little I could do. I had promised Lord Stark I would attend, and I intended to keep my word. We trained hard for the next few hours, the physical exertion helping to clear my mind. When we were done, I told John I'd bring him some food from the feast, but he waved me off, saying he'd get something from the kitchens. Afterward, I returned to my room in the smoking log, filling a large stone basin I had conjured days before with water, which I heated using incendio. As I undressed and sank into the makeshift bath, the hot water soothed my aching muscles, and I let out a sigh of relief. Balthazar, the snake who had been my constant companion, hissed contentedly in my mind, enjoying the warmth as much as I did. The snake had been absorbing knowledge at an impressive rate, already fluent in written High Valyrian. That skill would be invaluable when I eventually traveled to the east. For now, though, I let my mind wander, enjoying the rare moment of peace. The king is a pitiful excuse for a ruler, Erebus grumbled from where he lay sheathed nearby. More blubber than man. Yeah, I agreed, glancing at my wand on the tub's edge. With a quick flick, I cast a silencing charm on the door. Best to be cautious. 
Hard to believe that this is the man who once crushed armies with his war hammer, the rebel who seized the throne. Still, there had to be more to him than met the eye. After all, Eddard Stark, a man known for his judgment, seemed to hold Robert in high regard. That spoke volumes. Perhaps the king's former glory was buried beneath layers of indulgence and complacency. Time would tell if there was still any of that fire left. Why wouldn't the man who had conquered the kingdoms and ushered in peace deserve a moment of indulgence? It was a flimsy justification, but a justification nonetheless. From my brief observation, there seemed to be little unrest among the king's entourage. Sure, Robert Baratheon had grown rotund with comfort, but he still carried himself with a jovial air, speaking bluntly and with good humor. The queen, however, Cersei, was every bit the embodiment of privilege at addressing others with a sharp condescension that revealed her disdain for anyone she deemed beneath her. Then there was the prince, Joffrey. His name would later be revealed to me, though it wasn't hard to surmise he was of royal blood. The way he held himself, chest puffed up and sneering, made it obvious. His gaze repeatedly drifted toward Sansa, whose attention seemed fixated on him. She blushed and giggled every time he glanced her way, much to my relief. At least it meant she had stopped staring at me. It wasn't hard to imagine why King Robert had turned to excess. A wife like Cersei and a son like Joffrey, anyone would seek refuge in wine and feasts. After finishing my bath, I dried off quickly with a simple charm and dressed myself in my new outfit. I had crafted it from fine silk I found here, a dark blue long-sleeved shirt with a distinct eastern design paired with my old black cargo pants. I had no intention of parting with those, as they had proven both practical and inconspicuous. Over the weeks, no one had questioned my unusual attire. The shirt, though, was a special project. Using a spell, I'd carefully imprinted a small dragon spewing bluish-white lightning across the fabric. It was no easy task, and it took immense concentration to ensure the detail was right. The twins had taught me the technique back in my world. I remembered how they had practiced by changing Ron's shirt to every color imaginable, much to his annoyance. Eventually, they tired of the game, leaving Ron to deal with his neon wardrobe. Those were good times. Here, I had made the change permanent, finishing by adding an unbreakable charm to the fabric, ensuring it would last. Satisfied with my work, I examined myself in the mirror, murmuring, Acceptable. Are you leaving me behind tonight? Erebus, my sword, spoke in my mind. I nodded, not much point in bringing a sword to a feast. With a wave of my wand, I wrapped my right arm in bandages, concealing the scales beneath, and headed for the great hall. The guards at Winterfell barely glanced my way, having grown accustomed to my presence by now. The noise from the feast reached me long before I entered. Laughter, clinking cups, and music filled the air. As I stepped inside, the hall was packed with people celebrating, a bard playing a lively tune that, even after weeks in Westeros, I still didn't recognize. Harry, Rob Stark called, waving me over. I saved you a spot. I made my way over with a smile. Rob was seated alone, looking relieved to have a companion at that last. I noticed, I noticed Theon Greyjoy across the room, flirting shamelessly with a serving girl. I rolled my eyes and took a seat beside Rob. Greyjoy left you to fend for yourself, I see. I remarked, smirking. I, Rob replied, glancing at my clothes. Your outfit's different. I finally got around to having it mended. I lied easily, grabbing a few chicken legs from the table. Rob's eyes flicked the dragon embroidered on my shirt. Why the dragon, and is it breathing lightning? It is, I confirmed between bites. It's the sigil I've created for my future house, House of the Lightning Dragon. Rob seemed taken aback. Have you thought of words for your house yet? The words, each noble family had its own motto, a phrase meant to embody the essence of their house. The Lannisters hear me roar and the Starks winter is coming were common knowledge. It seemed strange to me, but it clearly carried weight here, reinforcing family pride and identity. Not yet, I admitted. The sigil is probably too soon, to be honest. Back in my world, the Black family's words were toujours pur, always pure, in French. I'd never thought to ask if the Potter family had a similar tradition. The words need to sound powerful, I mused, wiping my hand with a napkin. The lightning strikes. Balthazar, the dragon spirit within me, hissed in my mind. I grinned and repeated the suggestion aloud. Fitting, Rob nodded, recalling the times he and John had sparred with me. 
You fight like lightning, quick and relentless. I smirked at the compliment. If only he knew the true extent of my abilities. My gaze shifted to Prince Joffrey, who was once again staring at Sansa. She, in turn, was sneaking glances at him before whispering excitedly to her friend. At least I don't have to deal with her anymore, I muttered. Did you say something? Rob asked, glancing at me. Nothing important, I replied, just thinking aloud. We resumed our meal, the lively atmosphere continuing around us. After some time, Rob leaned in, lowering his voice. So, when are you going to challenge the Kingslayer? He glanced toward Jamie Lannister, who was moving through the crowd. I raised an eyebrow at him, then stood. How about now? Rob looked startled as I made my way toward Jamie, who was deep in conversation with Lord Stark. It would be good to see you in action, Jamie was saying as I approached. The competition has grown a bit stale. I don't fight in tournaments, Eddard replied plainly. Jamie leaned in closer, likely offering some quip, but Eddard remained unfazed. I don't fight in tournaments because when I fight for real, I don't want my opponent to know what I can do. I stepped forward, unable to resist adding, wise words, Lord Stark. As Sir Jaime's gaze settled on me, a faint smirk tugged at his lips. And who might you be? His voice was measured, yet carried a hint of disdain. Before I could reply, Eddard Stark interjected, his voice cutting through the air to gather attention from those nearby. This is Harry of House Potter, hailing from the free city of Myr, he introduced, the emphasis on my origins seemingly chosen to stir curiosity. Jamie extended his hand with an air of practiced politeness. A pleasure, I'm sure, he remarked, though his tone left the authenticity of his words open to interpretation. As I shook his hand, Eddard steered the conversation. How are you finding the feast so far? He asked, perhaps sensing the tension. I gave a small smile. The food is excellent, as always, I replied before turning my attention back to Jamie. But I must confess there's something more I wish to discuss. His expression shifted slightly, an eyebrow arched in curiosity. And what might that be? A duel, I stated plainly. I've heard tales of your skill, Sir Jaime, they say you're unmatched in combat across the realm. For a moment, there was only silence. Then Jamie's smirk widened. And why should I waste my time with you? He asked. You're not a knight of any renown. I've bested many who thought themselves worthy challengers, only for them to fall swiftly. Then surely one more victory wouldn't trouble you? I replied, letting my voice rise just enough for the surrounding crowd to hear. Unless, of course, you're hesitant. A hush fell over the hall as all eyes turned to us, the tension palpable. Jamie's gaze narrowed, his smile thin and sharp. Very well, he said with a tone that dared me to regret my words. Tomorrow at dawn, then. If you're so eager to learn humility, I'll gladly oblige. The murmur of the crowd swelled, then faded as the music resumed and conversations turned back to more familiar matters. I reclaimed my seat next to Rob and Theon, the latter sporting a faint red mark on his cheek that spoke of some recent mischief. You actually went through with it, Theon said, half in awe, half in disbelief. You must be mad to challenge the King's Lair. Taking a bite of my cooling meal, I met his gaze. Tell me, how swiftly would news of my victory spread if I defeated him in three strikes or less? Rob raised an eyebrow, his tone steady. Such a feat would certainly earn you a reputation, he said. It would establish you as a force to be reckoned with, an ally worth having. That was precisely my intention. In this feudal world, power and prestige came as much from perception as from skill. I had the resources and had started to forge connections, but to truly secure a place among these lords and knights, I needed to prove myself in their terms. Lady Catelyn might find me unorthodox, but her reservations paled in comparison to the arrogance of those like Cersei or Jaime. This was a society where deeds spoke louder than words. As I considered the strategy further, my attention was drawn across the hall. Is that a dwarf challenging five men to a drinking contest? I asked, incredulous. Rob nodded. That would be Tyrion Lannister, the infamous imp. With a grin, I stood to join the spectacle. The morning greeted me with the sting of a hangover, my head throbbing from the previous night's revelry. Groaning, I ran a hand through my disheveled hair. What exactly happened last night? I muttered. You drank yourself into a stupor, Balthazar's voice echoed in my mind, laced with a mixture of irritation and amusement. The imp outdrank you easily. 
Lord Stark had you brought back here after you passed out. As I worked to dull the ache with a touch of magic, a knock sounded at the door. What is it? I called out, trying to keep the weariness from my voice. A timid voice answered, Beg pardon, my lord. Sir Jaime awaits you in the courtyard. He bids you to join him. I took a moment to clear my head before responding. Tell him I'm on my way. Grabbing my sword, I set off toward the courtyard, stopping only to drink a cup of water to shake off the lingering dryness. When I arrived, a crowd had already gathered, and Jamie stood in the center, fully armored and looking self-assured. His gaze flicked toward me with a mocking glint. No armor, Potter? He called out, prompting chuckles from the onlookers. Armor would be a hindrance, I answered casually, glancing at the Starks before turning my attention to the royal family watching from the sidelines. King Robert's booming voice broke the silence. So, you're the one Ned has been talking about, he remarked, studying me with a mixture of curiosity and amusement. Bowing slightly, I acknowledged the monarch. I am your grace. I presume you will judge this duel. The king gave a hearty laugh. Aye, boy, I'll see if you're as mad as you seem or if there's something worth seeing in you. Jamie unsheathed his sword, the steel gleaming in the morning light. His confidence radiated from him as he took his stance, and the crowd fell into an expectant hush. For him, this was a matter of reputation. For me, it was an opportunity to carve a place in this world. As I prepared to face him, I knew that this duel wasn't merely about proving my prowess. It was about staking a claim to the respect and recognition that would ensure my future endeavors held weight in the eyes of those who ruled. The rules for this duel are straightforward. King Robert proclaimed, his voice booming with authority. You will fight until one of you yields or loses consciousness. Should I determine that one of you is soundly defeated, I will end the fight and declare the winner myself. An electric silence filled the air, intensifying my focus as I drew Erebus, the sleek black falchion gleaming in the light. Begin, the king shouted. The moment the signal was given, Jamie charged at me, intent on ending the duel swiftly to maximize my humiliation. But my muscles, energized by the magic of lightning, responded instantly. As he closed in, his movements appeared sluggish to me, a stark contrast to my heightened perception. I contemplated how much I wanted to teach him a lesson, a smirk creeping onto my face. I sidestepped his initial thrust, narrowly avoiding a follow-up horizontal slash by leaping back just in time. He unleashed a series of strikes, each one just missing its mark. The frustration was beginning to show, and I could sense his growing impatience. With renewed determination, he escalated his assault, but I remained unfazed. I stepped forward, easily dodging his wild attacks, and with a swift motion, I brought the pommel of Erebus crashing down on his forehead, drawing a trickle of blood as he staggered backward, clutching his injury. Gasps echoed through the crowd, their shock palpable. Um, as Jamie regained his footing, I let him have a moment to collect himself before he launched into another offensive, his attacks now fierce and desperate. He must have realized that I was capable of hurting him, and it fueled his aggression. I met his strikes with precision, countering and deflecting while landing small hits to his face and armor, careful not to cause lasting damage. When he paused, sword raised overhead and a challenging glare in his eyes, it was clear he believed I would falter. He was about to learn how misguided that assumption was. I switched my grip on the sword, feigning a thrust to draw his focus. Then, without warning, I dashed toward him, evading his counterattack and swinging horizontally, the blade slicing through the air toward his neck. The crowd held its breath as I halted my strike, the edge of my sword barely drawing blood. Jamie stood frozen, disbelief etched across his features. Do you yield? I called out, my voice clear and resonant. I, I yield. Jamie Lannister, the Kingslayer, admitted with visible reluctance. A heavy silence followed his confession, broken only when King Robert erupted into cheers, his enthusiasm infectious. Soon the crowd joined in, their cheers echoing around us. As I withdrew my blade, wiping the blood on my shirt, something I would remedy later, I glanced back at Jamie, still reeling from his unexpected defeat. Is this the first time you've tasted defeat? I teased lightly as the applause subsided. No, he replied, though respect flickered in his eyes, albeit begrudgingly, but it's the first time since childhood that I've lost so easily. I stepped closer, a smirk playing on my lips. 
So easily, you poor man. Remember, I only used one hand. It could have been much worse. You, he stammered, clearly flustered by my nonchalance. A splendid battle indeed, I proclaimed, extending my hand. Thank you, Sir Jaime. He shook my hand, still dazed by the outcome. We turned to face the king and offered him a brief bow, the crowd erupting into another round of cheers as Robert rose from his seat. Catching John's eye, I noticed a hint of amusement in his expression while everyone else looked on in astonishment. The Stark children were particularly taken aback. Arya was practically bouncing with excitement. Bran stared in shock, and Sansa... Oh, Sansa was gazing at me with a starry-eyed admiration that made me uneasy. Ugh, fangirls. I had dealt with my share of those in the past few years. They often overlooked their own interests just to catch a glimpse of me, the so-called boy who lived. Meanwhile, Queen Cersei shot me a furious glare and I noted her son Joffrey scowling at me, a spark of rage in his eyes. Making enemies already? Erebus chimed in my mind, amusement coloring his tone. That was quite the duel. King Robert bellowed, clearly entertained. Come, Potter, I invite you to dine with me. I would be honored, your grace, I replied, feeling a twinge of hunger as we were led back to the great hall. This lunch felt more intimate. The king sought a private conversation. His wife, the queen, was absent, likely engaged in some southern pastime, while I discovered that Joffrey had siblings I hadn't previously known about. They sat at another table, dining with Bran, Rickon, and Arya, who couldn't help sneaking glances in my direction. At our table were Eddard and Catelyn Stark. John sat beside me, attempting to ignore the death glare Caitlin aimed at him. Reluctantly, he had joined us at my request. I intended to show him how to navigate the intricacies of nobility, and this was a start. As we settled in, I couldn't shake the feeling that today's duel was just the beginning of a much larger game. The political stakes were high, and each encounter, um, each choice, would ripple through the intricate web of alliances and enmities in this new world I had stepped into.